Good morning, North Livingston. Good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. If you would, let's stand as we begin our service with a time of prayer. Certainly good to be able to be back today, to be, be together. Uh, I want to remind you or call your attention to the fact that we will have a uh, very important uh, short business meeting. It's a, a regular business meeting uh, after service. If you call this your church home, I encourage you to stay. We have some decisions uh, some things coming up as far as the building that we're going to be doing. And so I encourage you to, to be sure that you uh, uh, stay for that meeting today. As we go to the Lord in a time of prayer, uh, again, we have uh, several on our list, some additions. Uh, those that are uh, uh, mourning the loss of a loved one, that list seems like every week it, it, it amazes me. I don't, I don't remember this many people passing away uh, and not just COVID, but everything, uh, but uh, several in Crittenden and Livingston County. Uh, I think all of our funeral homes are full. So just remember those families continue to lift them up. Pray for one another. Uh, some that have had some uh, tests, waiting some results. Some had some procedures, um, doing better, but we still want to lift one another up, continue to pray for each other. Uh, do you have updates to our list? Maybe some that I haven't uh, uh, mentioned. Anybody that, I think we've got some on, when the list comes up, there's some that's been added there. I want to continue. Remember, we were praying, um, Brother Larry Woodall from Marion Baptist, his wife Barbara uh, was on the ventilator this week, came off yesterday doing very well. Uh, but there are some in the community that are testing positive still. Uh, continue to lift those up and pray for those. Uh, we we want to certainly pray for each other and just continue to, to remember everybody in our community as, as we have been throughout this, remembering our leadership, especially praying for, uh, again, leadership in our schools. They still have a lot of decisions and, and uh, decisions just making uh, daily. Also, um, pray for our country. Uh, pray for the world situation. Looks like a, a possible war ensuing soon. And um, um, as always, America being drug into the middle of that. So just pray for uh, leadership and, and pray for, uh, as, as we pray, our missionaries, uh, you don't realize it, but when we talk about a country uh, that's got uh, the potential of war coming up and they've asked Americans to leave like Ukraine, we've got missionaries on the ground there. Uh, and they're right in the middle of this feeling like they can't leave. And so just, uh, I know we pray for our missionaries regularly. And then we have the emphasis when we have our uh, uh, Lottie Moon and, and Annie Armstrong and those, those emphasis, but still uh, let's pray for the missionaries that are in, in the middle of these hot spots, these regions. Um, they, they have a tough job normally, but it, it's extra difficult uh, during these times. Is there anybody else? Brother Darrell. A text from Joyce Barkley this morning. Pat Wiggins is in the hospital in Florida. She has a bad bladder infection. And okay. She's probably been there for several days. This is Patty's family. Sister in law. All right. Anyone else? All right, let's go to the Lord in the time of prayer. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for your blessings. God, we, we thank you for the, the, the opportunity, the privilege to be uh, together in person today. God, the snow is beautiful, but uh, God, we've had it. We've enjoyed it. Now it's gone and we're thankful for that. God, thank you for protecting uh, those uh, that were affected by it. I know some that were even without power and, and God, we, we rely on those conveniences, but uh, God, we just, we thank you for protecting, especially those that uh, are, are particularly close to us here, God, it seems like you just watched over and we thank you for that. And, and God, we come to you this morning and, and Father, we have such a lengthy prayer list. God, so many uh, in our communities that are, are needing a touch, needing a healing touch. And, and even some that we prayed for this week when this, the, the circumstances look bleak and, and God, you, you answered prayers and, and God, that just always encourages our faith and we thank you for that. Father, we continue to lift one another up. God, you uh, uh, see each family, uh, the circumstances within those families. God, you know that uh, each of us have those in our, our families, our circle of influence, uh, Father, that uh, are lost. 
God, some of us that uh, really burdened about loved ones and, and God, some of those are just unspoken and, and you know everything about those circumstances and God, we just join our faith together to lift one another, to lift our families together to you. And God, we're reminded of the church in Acts, how that they, they would come together and they were of one mind. And God, we understand that means that they, they cared about one another. They were concerned for one another. And God, we too, uh, God, we have a love for each other and for one another's families. And so God, we join our prayers together. And, and God, you know, each situation, we just ask that you touch. God, I, I, I won't mention from the pulpit, but God, you know, uh, those that are burdened and have shared. And God, we just lift those to you right now, asking that you just come on the scene. God, we, when we pray for healing, we pray for relationships, we pray for lost loved ones. God, you're a God that knows everything about every person. And Father, as we mention those names to you right now, God, we just, we just know, uh, God, that you're on the scene and we thank you for that, that you just, we ask that you touch, that you heal, that you just, uh, Father, send the, the Holy Spirit to convict, send somebody to be a witness and, and God just, uh, we pray that we just see a real revival uh, in our families and our circle of influence. God, we, we pray for healing for those that are on the list, those that have been mentioned this morning. Uh, God, we pray for our time together today. I pray that you just be with Joe and the team as they come to lead us. And God, that we would just turn our hearts and our, our thoughts towards you in, in a time of worship. And then God, the message today. God, I, I feel this is a message that you've given. Uh, God, I've, I've been seeing uh, your hand working. Uh, God, just in, in, in that message this week and just uh, those, those little ways that you just give your your uh, approval. And, and God, I've seen that so much in these last two, three days. And God, I just thank you for that. And then I ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, uh, God, that this word would just challenge us all. Uh, God, that you would just uh, uh, use us, uh, God, to be a, a witness in our community and our families, our workplaces. Uh, God, that we could just see a real turning to you. We know that, that scripture says, uh, God prophecy says that there will be a great falling away. Uh, but God, we ask that uh, our families be the exception uh, as we come to the close of what we, we certainly believe is, is getting close to you sending Jesus back for that, that second coming. And so God, we just ask uh, for our loved ones. God, we again, thank you for the time together today. Ask for your anointing. God, be in our time in the business meeting, some decisions we have to make. And God, we want to be good stewards of all that you've entrusted us with. And, and Father, we look around us, we see so many uh, blessings. That was nothing more than just you answering prayers on this church's behalf. And God, we just continue to ask that. Uh, God, that this church be a lighthouse and a beacon in this community. God, we love you. We thank you. We commit this service into your hands. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all of God people said, amen. You may be seated. Joe, come and lead us. A Joan, you coming? All right. Joan and then Joe.
Good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you this morning. We got any birthdays or anniversaries today? Got one tomorrow? Well, let's sing. Let's sing happy birthday to you early. Huh? It's tomorrow. It's old tomorrow. Huh? Buddy, it's old tomorrow. Okay, buddy. Yeah. Well, let's sing happy birthday. Our Valentine's baby. <laughs> Standing on the promises. some of God's promises this morning. <clears throat> Never leave you forsake. Never leave you forsake us. What else? He's coming again. He's coming again. Yeah, let's just... Let's, let's let's name some more. And he work all things for good for us. Amen. Amen. Talking to God about God's promises, it it does it it encourages us and strengthens us. That's something too, when you you say that that He will never destroy the earth again with water. But it will be destroyed someday with fire. Be surprised the people that don't, when you see the bow in the sky, that a lot of people don't. They think there's 
all kinds of other things that it means. But Anybody else before we sing the last verse? Can we stand on the last verse? Okay, here we go. Last verse. so sweet to trust in Jesus. his time.
God, as we bow before you, Lord, in your presence today. Thanking you, Lord, for this day, Lord, that you've given to us and allowed us to be a part of. Thank you, Lord, for each and every one, Lord, that's here today. Thank you for each and every one, Lord, that's watching by internet. God, we just pray, Lord, that you will just move your spirit, Lord, would move. Draw us closer to you, Lord. God, we just thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. God, forgive us, Lord, where we don't thank you. Lord, may we be a, a people, Lord, of, of gratitude and thankfulness, Lord, and acknowledge, Lord, what you've done for us. Lord, I pray for Brother Danny today, Lord, as he comes, breaks the bread of life to us, Lord. God, I pray for the, our business meeting, Lord. God, I just lift it up to you right now, Lord. God, and I, I want to thank you right now, Lord, that how things has fell in place and how you've led in that, Lord. But God, we just pray that everything we do today, Lord, we bring honor and glory to you. Let God and direct in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of John, chapter number 13. John chapter 13. I'll be reading from the King James Version today. We've been going through the book of John recently uh, in preparations for uh, approaching Easter and some activities we're going to be doing in the church. And uh, one of the things we're wanting to get accomplished uh, is to be able to reach out into the homes in our community. And part of what we're going to do with that is to provide them uh, with a copy of the Bible, but also a small copy of uh, the Gospel of John and the book of Romans. And so we're kind of looking at the book of John. Why is that important? Why are we wanting to uh, emphasize the book of John? And as I've said repeatedly, <clears throat> one of the things we, I do uh, with a new convert, new Christian, somebody interested in just beginning to study the Bible uh, is to tell them a good place to begin is the book of John because of uh, what John tries to present, how he tries to present Jesus and Jesus' ministry here on earth and the kingdom of God. And so we've looked in the last few weeks, uh, uh, we weren't able to be here last week, but last week we talked about uh, uh, in, in the, the, the broadcast, the video, uh, we looked at John and, and, and where Jesus was teaching to the disciples. The week before that we had, uh, uh, had the Lord's Supper and so we were looking at that part. Uh, today we're going to John chapter 13, which is right there with the Lord's Supper. We're kind of moving around a little bit because of, of having the Lord's Supper week before last. But um, we talked last week about how that God, uh, Jesus, uh, said it was necessary that he leave. Of course, he knew uh, when he was teaching those disciples uh, just that simple uh, 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 illustration or lesson of him leaving meant he was going to be crucified. He knew what that in involved. And so we move back today to uh, part of where we were uh, when he said he's going to prepare a place for us. Uh, some of us have that uh, idea in our mind that that's row after row of mansion. Of course, the, the scripture actually says, uh, in my father's house, singular, uh, are, are many. And then uh, some of the, the versions use that as mansions or some uh, versions actually have that in, in many rooms in one big house. We talked about last week, uh, I remembered a song that we uh, did in Vacation Bible School a few years ago. Uh, one of the contemporary songs, uh, Big House. Uh, talking about God's big house. And so as Jesus is preparing those disciples, uh, in John chapter number 13, he's at that last supper, which we talked about week before last. But something he does, um, very peculiar, if you think about the fact that he, uh, at, at, at that point being totally God, uh, he knew within just a matter of hours uh, that he's going to be dying on a cruel Roman cross. He knew uh, that he's going to face the, the worst humiliation that a man can face with all that he would have to go through in his arrest, his mock trials and the beatings and, and then ultimately on that cross. And so 
He's with those disciples. He's at the, the table of the Last Supper, uh, the Passover meal, and of course all that that involved for them being Jews and all that that symbolized going back to uh, Israel's bondage and, and, and being released in Egypt and, and that Passover and then God instituting the Passover meal. And so that meal has just finished and Jesus is with those disciples. In John chapter number 13, I'm going to ask that you stand as we look at verses 1 through 8. And this lesson uh, that Jesus gives just before uh, he's to go out into the garden, uh, before he's to pray, is there any other way? And, and uh, you know, paraphrasing it, God says, no, there's no other way. And he has to go to the cross. And, and of all the lessons he could teach at that point, you know you're about to die. You know you're about to face the cross. You know that this is the, the culmination of God's 4,000 years of the redemptive plan being fulfilled. You know what you're going to face. You know what God's plans are. And you've got just a few minutes to teach these 12 guys, these 11 guys, you've got just a few minutes to teach them one last lesson. What's it going to be? And this is John chapter 13 beginning at verse number one. John remembers a few years later, he, he, he looks back and he remembers this is the last, one of the last things he teaches us before his crucifixion. Now he, he teaches more after in, in the, the, the resurrected body, but this is the last thing when he's got them all together. And so if it's that important, what can we as the church get out of that, that lesson? John chapter 13, beginning at verse number one. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that the hour was come, that he would depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Talking about those that, that were in his inner circle, that group that was right there with him. And verse number two says, And supper being ended... The devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and he laid aside his garments and he took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he pours water into a basin and began to wash those men's feet and to wipe them with the towel that he had just tied around his waist. And then he comes to Simon Peter and Peter says to him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And Peter says unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together. Again, Father, just the blessing of being in the building together. I just, God, I love this time that we get to come together as church. We get to come together as family. God, we get to gather around the word in your presence. What a privilege. God, I thank you for your word. God, the lesson that you put in such a simple story of Jesus washing those disciples' feet. But God, as we think about the context of what was going on, what was about to happen, what is, what is so important in this lesson for us? God, in these next few moments, I ask for the Holy Spirit's anointing as we try to unpack that. God, that you would just speak to our hearts. And God, something that was so important to Jesus to leave with those disciples just before Calvary. God, let us have the same urgency, the same importance today as the Holy Spirit teaches us here together as your children today, as your followers, your disciples. God, if there's one under the sound of my voice in this room or by way of watching on, on video that doesn't know you as Savior, God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would convict and draw. God, that they would come to know you. And God, each of us that have committed our lives to you, 
God, that this would be a, a teachable moment, a learning time. God, that we could just draw closer. God, we love you. We thank you. We commit this service into your hands. It's in Jesus' name I ask. And all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated. I think one of the things we see in John chapter 13, Jesus washing the disciples' feet, the lesson that he teaches us here. If we were to look in, in Paul thinking about this and Paul teaching the churches in, in Philippians chapter 2, uh, Paul doesn't particularly address the washing of the feet, but he, he addresses the attitude behind that, the lesson behind that, what, what Jesus was trying to get those disciples to understand just before he was to go back to the Father. And I think the thing you see the most in this is you have to remember Jesus was God in flesh. He was 100% divine. He was, he was fully God's son, God come to this earth for the, the sole purpose of our salvation redeeming us. And yet one of the last things he wanted to teach these men was I think a lesson, in, not hygiene, <laughs> it was a lesson in humility. I grew up in a church that when we had the Lord's Supper, uh, after we did the, the, the juice and the bread, we would retire the men to one room, the women to another room, and, and we would actually wash one another's feet. I can tell you growing up in that church as a child, you cannot be mad at somebody and stay mad at somebody and wash their feet. You just can't do it. There's something about uh, washing somebody else's feet. Now, I know the way we did it. Uh, I can remember in our home, you made sure your feet were clean before you went. Uh, you made sure your nails were trimmed before you went. All I had, you know, you just you're kind of vain enough to do that. But there was something about those men. And I remember all the way from us as children and teenagers, all the way up to, to senior saints. And I can remember those as some of the sweetest services. We would, we would go into that room. We would have a time of prayer. And then we would wash one another's feet and then we would end with a song and then we would all come together. The men and the women would come back together before we dismissed the service. Some, some sweet, sweet memories. When I think of that and I think of what Jesus did for those disciples, Judas, he already says here, it was already put into his heart to betray him. There's no indication here that Jesus didn't wash Judas's feet. Think about that. God on earth that created the universe, that created Judas, the God that loves you enough to save you. And he washed Judas's feet. He comes to Peter. And Peter says, you wash my feet? No. I can almost hear Peter shouting it. In, in, in earshot enough that even John heard it. And Jesus almost rebukes. He does. He rebukes Peter. If I don't, if you don't let me do this, you have no part of me. What Jesus was saying is, Peter, there's something you've got to learn here. Now, we have the advantage of hindsight. We know, we know what happens within just a few hours when Peter's sitting around that campfire and that young girl says, you, by your speech, it gives you away. I know you're one of his. And Peter, for fear of being arrested like Jesus had been, going through what he had seen, Jesus, whatever, Peter denies him. And in all of that and leading up to the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit coming and Peter being filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, all up to that, you know that one of the things Peter was remembering was Jesus bowing at his feet, taking the basin, the bowl, the water, and washing his feet. Peter was remembering the Son of God. Peter knew who he was. When Jesus asked, who do men say that I am? Peter says, you're the son of God. 
Peter knew who he was. And Peter was thinking, no doubt, through all of that. And yet he humbled himself. Humbled himself. The God of the universe showing us this is how much I love you. This is how much I will give for you in that act of humility. The dictionary defines humility according to Webster's dictionary, the, the quality or the state of being humble. I always hate it when they define a word with the word. I remember being in school and they would ask you a definition. And I can remember having teachers say, don't define the word with the word. So when you look the dictionary up, what is it to, to the humility? And it says it's the quality or the state of being humble. Humble, humility. It's almost the same thing. How can you define the word with the same thing? That's a very simplistic definition. But as Christians, when we define the word humility, I see John chapter 13. I see the Son of God, a man that was able to take the beating with the cat of nine tails that he took, the man that was able to take a crown of thorns pressed down on his head, the man that was able to take being beaten and spit upon, and then having to carry his own cross all of that way to Calvary. The man that when he got to Calvary willingly laid himself down. They didn't have to fight him or hog time. The man that let them drive those spikes in his hands and his feet. The man that hung on that cross. Yet... He had a servant's heart. And the lesson he would leave for us through these disciples, through John, through the Word of God, knowing it was going to be the Word of God because he was God, but yet he was a man also, leaving the lesson for us. Have a servant's heart. Have a humble spirit. Have a, a heart of humility. When we understand that as Christians, when we really get a hold of that, to be humble like Jesus was, to, to live like Jesus, to serve like Jesus, it changes how we interact with people, how we live our life, how we conduct business, how we, how we do everything. And we realize through through studying that, you know, as humans, the things that we have, the things that we acquire, the things that we work for, we, we, we tend to, to, to look at ourselves and we look at others and we rate others successes on what they've done. And yet as Christians, we have to realize that everything that we have, our abilities, our possessions, our talents, everything that we are, God gave it to us. It's God that allows it. We've done nothing on our own outside of God's provision and God allowing us to be who we are, to have what we have. And so ultimately we, we give an account to God for what we have, for who we are, for what we possess. That was the lesson Jesus was showing these men, this, this act of humility that would lead to submission. Now, we have those in the group, Judas Iscariot. We see what Judas ultimately did. We see the end. And again, we have the advantage, the, the hindsight of looking back because everything has already happened. We see what Judas did in betraying Jesus, even after the act of washing his feet, even to the point of knowing he was willing God was willing. He knew who he was and yet betrayed him. And we know his end. The Bible tells us that he went out and committed suicide. We look at what we think is the opposite of, of the two in the story as John presents it, the opposite of Judas that betrayed Jesus. 
and committed suicide. And Peter, that denied Jesus. I mean, if you're going to compare sins and what people did, Peter denied him. But Peter was able to take the lessons that Jesus taught. Peter was able to, to take and process what had happened to watch it even if from afar. And then Peter was in that upper room on the day of Pentecost. Peter was there waiting and praying when the Holy Spirit came and filled him. And we see Peter became such a, a success, such a, a talent for God. And we look at ourselves and what makes us different from Judas? What makes us different from Peter. And so we look at the lesson that Jesus gives, this lesson of humility, this lesson of submission, this lesson in obedience. You know, Peter was there in the garden when Jesus bowed and prayed to his father, is there any other way that this redemption could be accomplished? Is there any other way that this cup could pass from me? Peter, even though he and the others were sleeping, John there too, Peter, James, and John, when he was there and he, he was sleeping and he couldn't stay awake, he couldn't force himself to, to be obedient to waiting and watching as Jesus would ask, but, but Peter witnessed it all just as John did witnessing it all and, and how they were able to take and later use that as submission, as obedience. And so that led, led Paul as you follow Paul in the scriptures when he comes to write to the, the church, to the Christians in Philippi in Philippians chapter two. And no doubt part of what Paul was thinking as he's addressing the church in Philippians two is this very act of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. This very act of God in flesh on earth about to go to Calvary. And the last lesson he could give you is a lesson in humility and submission and obedience. And so Paul writes in Philippians chapter two, beginning at verse number one, if there be therefore any consolation, any encouragement, if there's, if there's anything good you can get in serving Christ, if there's any comfort of love, if there's any affection, if there's any fellowship of the capital S-P-I-R-T, fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity of God, if there's any bowels and mercies, if there's any affection and, and the mercy of God, fulfill ye my joy. Paul says this, this would make me happy. This would, this would fulfill what I've been trying to teach you as the church that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, unity, everybody on the same page. Paul says, this is where we've got to, to strive to get to. Humility, submission, obedience, let nothing be done through selfish ambition, through strife, through vain glory. Whatever you do, don't do it just for yourself. When you get up in the morning, don't just go to work just for what you can do for yourself. But when you make money, you're making money for how can I, how can I use this to benefit others? How can I use this to benefit God? How can I, I benefit the kingdom with this glory? It, let nothing, that, that's a big word, nothing. Paul says, let nothing be done just for selfishness. Go back to Judas. Go back to Peter. And John's watching them both and John's writing this down. Go back to Jesus. What Jesus did, supper being ended, he girded himself with a towel and took a basin and filled it with water. It's not the act of washing the feet so much as the lesson he was leaving. 
Let nothing be done through strife, through vainglory, through selfish ambition, through conceit, not just for yourself, but in humility. You talk about being humble. When Jesus washed those men's feet, and we've talked about this. If you've heard lessons on this, you've heard, you, you've heard the teachings of what feet would have been like in Jesus' day. Dusty roads, wear, wearing sandals, walking everywhere you go. The streets are crowded with mules and donkeys and camels and goats and sheep. I don't need to get any more graphic on what they walk through, do I? And he takes these men's feet. They didn't go to the salon and get a pedicure regularly. Talk about abasing yourself. Talk about humbling yourself. This was usually a job if you had servants in your house, if you were well off enough to have servants, this is what the servants did when company came over. They met them at the door and it was just kind of custom in that part of the world, in that culture, in that time that they would wash the servants, the slaves would wash people's feet before they would come in your house because of what the feet looked like, what they were covered in before you let them in your house. Now it's as simple as leave your shoes at the door. Not so in Jesus' day. And all that Jesus is doing there is showing this lesson that Paul is teaching later to the church. And he says, anything that you do, let nothing you do be done for yourself. Jesus didn't wash those men's feet to benefit himself. He didn't say, oh, I'm going to wash these feet so people will say I'm a, I'm a great leader by being a servant. That's not what he did it for. He did it to teach them to teach us what it means to put other people before yourself. Paul goes ahead in verse number three of Philippians two to say, let, let nothing be done through, through selfish ambition or through conceit, but in humility, in lowliness of mind, esteem other people better than yourself. Put, put others, make others more important than you. Look not every man on his own things. Don't just look out for yourself. But think about and put other people first. Do you know what a world we would live in if everybody, ourselves included, would put other people ahead of themselves? If we would think about others first before we did something, said something, acted some way? Jesus did nothing with the expectation that, that, that he would be repaid or he would get something out of it. Everything Jesus did was deliberate and on point. Jesus said, what I do, I do because the Father has sent me and I do what the Father bids me to do. And so this act of washing their feet, he was, he was teaching these men, you put others before yourself. You think of others first. And so church... The lesson for us, yeah, we get saved to stay out of hell, but living that life as a Christian, setting that example of what a Christian is, what a, what a church member should be, it's being humble, having enough humility that we think of others before ourselves. Look at what Jesus does here in John chapter 13. Look, some things that really stick out about this. Jesus knew, he knew that he was about to be handed over to the authorities. Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world. He knew exactly what was fixing to happen. He knew he was about to die on that cross. He knew he was about to go back to the Father. I find it interesting that the last lesson he could teach us, I mean, what's the most important thing he wanted to teach us? Get saved and stay out of hell. Yeah, that's important. But between here and there, while we're living the life as a Christian, he said one of the most important things you can do is to put others before yourself. 
to think of others first, to not be selfish, to serve others, to be humble, humility, having a heart of humility. Verse 3 says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands and that he had come from God and he was going back to God, he didn't have an identity crisis about who he was. He knew he was the Son of God. He knew what was about to take place. He knew exactly who he was. He knew that he was God in flesh. You know, sometimes we want to think we're better than somebody else. We're, we're, we're better off than somebody else. And sometimes we even, to the point of thinking we're going to heaven, we think that gives us the advantage. And yet Jesus shows us what that really looks like. On your knees, with a towel about your waist, washing somebody's dirty feet. Not exactly what you would think of as the glitz and the glamour of being the king of the universe. As a Christian, when we look at other people, we need to see them through the eyes of Jesus. And Jesus' eyes were at that moment the reason he was going to that cross was that people would be in heaven that they wouldn't go to hell. And so we, as we look at others, we need to look at them with no matter what they've done, no matter how they conduct themselves, no matter what they're doing to us at the time. And, and I got to tell you as a preacher, sometimes when you stand here, you're standing here with guilt because you've not always been and you've not done, and you've not behaved as. And so the word of God kind of reaches out and slaps you. I'm not saying I'm perfect in this. I'm just saying this is what Jesus was saying you need to have in mind. The act of being that lowliest of servants, that, the, the job that was reserved for the lowliest of servants. And Jesus regarding this servanthood and this humility as so important that he, he leaves it as the last lesson before he goes to Calvary. And Jesus is saying, as a follower of mine, as a Christian, a Christ follower, you're going to have to be different than the rest of the world. That act of getting on his knees, girding that towel around his waist, washing their feet, he was basically saying in, in illustration form, in, in kids' church form, children's church form, men, Men, this is, this is the heart you've got to have if you're going to turn this world around, if you're going to change the world. And we know with the advantage of hindsight, they did change the world. It did transform them. Jesus shattered the misconception of a, a servant being the lowliest of positions that you could have. He shattered that misconception being God in the flesh and washing their feet. You know, for, for some of us serving others, having that humility, taking, taking the, the, the short end of the stick, sometimes that's hard to do. You know, sometimes you just know you're right. You know that you've got the correct answer and somebody else doesn't. Sometimes you know that this is going to cost you and it doesn't have to cost you. But you remember who you're representing? You remember who your father is? You remember the, the, the cost? If you don't do this right and, and if, if you don't set the example, Jesus is saying you need to have that in the front of your mind. You see, Jesus is saying when you become a Christian, God remakes your heart. When you become a Christian, God transforms you. And your heart should be a heart of a servant. You look at what the church has done over the years. The, the, the church established the schools, the original schools were, it, that came through the church. I know history books are trying to change some of the hospitals. 
All of your, your big major hospitals, go to any big city, any hospital, big hospitals. They may not have the identity today, but where they started was from the churches. You've got your big Baptist hospitals, your big Methodist hospitals, your big Catholic hospitals, the church. Why? Because they were serving their communities. They were taking what God had given them, the resources God had given them, the abilities that God had provided and being good stewards of what God had given. And then that comes out as churches, as hospitals, as orphanages, helping our communities. That's the picture Jesus is leaving as he's washing their feet. Paul goes ahead to tell the Philippians in verse number five, let this mind be in you, this attitude. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Church, you want to do it God's way? Follow Jesus' example. Do what Jesus did. In other words, use the mind of Christ in all that you do and in that doing good for others. And also Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual, born again, a son of God, he judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we, who is we? 1 Corinthians, church. Who is Paul writing to? Christians, the church. But we have the mind of Christ. The world doesn't understand it. But we of all people in the church, we have to understand and we have to have the behavior that Jesus had. How do we get that? An intimate relationship with Christ. An intimate relationship with his word. Studying the lessons that he left for us. Humility, humbleness, their attitudes that we have to have. We must discipline ourselves. And that leads us to serving others, even when we don't want to. Even when we know we're taking the short end of the stick. We must serve others with gladness, with joy. We must serve others the way that Jesus served others. And you remember what I said a while ago, when Jesus did that, there was no expectation of a reward I remember when the tornado came through December the 10th and a lot of people were rushing to help. And I remember what a lot of the complaint was from people watching other people go to help. And one of the things I, I read online that they were saying was if you go to help, don't take your camera with you. Don't be taking pictures of yourself doing the good deeds. Don't do it to brag on yourself. Jesus, as he did these things, he didn't do them to be seen of man. He didn't do them for the pats on the back. He did them with a heart of love for those men, a love for the church, a love for us in the lesson that he was giving us. Serving others, it, 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 it should give you joy. You should, you should enjoy it. I mean, we get, we get blessings when we do that, but that's not why we do it. Paul says the reason you do it is that you have the mind of Christ. If we want to make a difference in this world, then we serve others like Jesus did. So when you think of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, remember the context of the lesson that he was giving them, the time that he was teaching it, what was about to take place, and the importance of all of the things that he could have taught just before he goes to Calvary. And he teaches those men, have a servant's heart. Have a spirit of humility. Be willing to serve others. Think more of others than you think of yourself. May we as Christians, may we as a church have that attitude and that mindset. And if we don't have that attitude and that mindset, may we pray that God would give us the burden, that God would give us that heart, that mindset 
that we would have, as Paul says, the mind of Christ. Joe, if you and the team would come, we'll have a hymn of invitation. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the lesson and illustration as we see Jesus, as we see God in flesh, the Son of God, girding that towel around his waist, filling that basin with water. And Jesus' lesson to those men, you don't know what I'm doing now, but soon you will. And that lesson of having a heart of humility, being willing to serve others. God, as a church, we pray that you would let us be a church that would serve. God, we know that the devil has thrown this pandemic into the mix and so much has had to be stopped and not started. And we need the wisdom of when and how. God, give us opportunities to be servants to our fellow man, to our community. Give that to us individually. Give that to us corporately as a church. God, we thank you for what we see our association doing and helping. And, and God, we thank you for the generosity of those even of this church that have helped. And, and God, as much as they do to give to missions and as much as they've done to give to the tornado victims and, and throughout the years how this church has helped this community. But God, there's still more to do. God, I pray that you would just give us that heart, that desire, that burden. Give us the opportunities. Help us to seize those opportunities. God, as always, if there's one under the sound of my voice that doesn't know you as Savior, God, Paul said to that person, all of this is foolishness. So God, I ask if there's one that's listening right now and they don't know that they know that they know that they'd spend eternity in heaven if they died right now, I pray that the Holy Spirit would convict them. God, you just speak, speak into their hearts. Draw them to a place of salvation. God, those that are Christians, we know we're going to heaven, but God, what do we do every day? God, help us to, to have an attitude of, of service, a heart of humility a love for our fellow man, a burden for the lost around us, and then the initiative to do something about it, to be your light, your salt in a sin-darkened world. God, we thank you for our time together. Pray that you would just be with us through the furtherances of the service. Let the Holy Spirit have his way, your way, in Jesus' name. Joe, what are we singing? As you stand, some singing, some praying, but all obeying the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. time together. Thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the lesson that Jesus left for us. God, I pray for each one under the sound of my voice. Those that have made decisions, those that have made commitments to you. God, those that the Holy Spirit is speaking to right now. God, we as a church, we, we join our prayers together to lift one another. God, that one that's asked you, that's made a commitment to you, that's made a decision today. God, I just pray that the Holy Spirit would just continue to, to speak and instruct. God, again, we ask as a church that you just lead us, guide us, 
God, that we be in the center of your will. God, until you come again, there's much to do. Jesus even said the fields are, are wide unto harvest. God, help us to have the hearts to be the laborers, to be the witnesses, to be the workers. God, we thank you for this church. Thank you for placing this church and this community for its years of service. God, I pray that you would be with this church and, and God, in the next few moments in this business meeting, the decisions that have to be made, we just ask for your guidance in all of that. Go with us as we go from this place. God, I pray that you would just use us in, in the fields. God, to be your light, your witnesses, to be your hands and feet in a sin-darkened world. We love you. We commit this service and, and thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Just a short transition and then we will have business meeting.